Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update video and podcast. Today, we have our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news about COVID-19 with the AMA's Director of Science, Medicine, and Public Health, Andrea Garcia in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Andrea, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, at the time, it, uh, filming at least, we had not yet reached uh, the tragic milestone that we've been expecting, which is one million COVID deaths in the U.S. But uh, it is very likely by the time that this episode airs uh, that it will be making headlines for days already. So uh, let's start there. What responses uh, are we seeing? Thanks for having me, Todd. And, and it, it is truly tragic. And I think few could have fathomed a number like this at the start of the pandemic. And although those numbers do vary slightly across the different uh, COVID databases, uh, many look to Johns Hopkins uh, as the most reliable, and, and that number currently is 999,852 COVID deaths, which means we'll likely hit that million mark within the next day. Uh, in anticipation of that, President Biden ordered federal flags to fly at half staff until this past Monday. And in a formal statement, he said the U.S. must remain vigilant against a virus that has forever changed the country. We know that COVID-19 is now the third leading cause of death among Americans behind only heart disease and cancer. And an estimated 250,000 children have lost parents or caregivers to COVID and nearly 200,000 have lost one or both parents. As we look back at all these numbers, what have we learned about those deaths? Well, the New York Times, I think, did a good job of trying to put those numbers into context over the weekend, citing that more Americans have died of COVID-19 than in two decades of car crashes or on battlefields in all of the country's wars combined. Uh, the news outlet analyzed 25 months of data on deaths during the pandemic and, and really confirmed, I think, what we've already known to be true, and that is that some demographic groups, occupations, and communities were at greater risk than others. So a significant portion of the nation's oldest residents died, making up about three quarters of total, total deaths. And among younger adults, Black and Hispanic people died at much higher rates. When we look at people of working age, it's those essential workers that, that really bore the brunt of the virus. And I think equally tragic when we think about it, more than 429,000 people have died of COVID since adults in the US became eligible for COVID-19 vaccines in April of 2021. And while some of those deaths did occur among the vaccinated, many uh, in older persons or, or those who hadn't yet received booster doses the majority of those were unvaccinated. Um, so one statistic shows that people who are unvaccinated have been at least nine times as likely to die since April of 2021. And, and of course, that means that many of these deaths were preventable. And I think, unfortunately, one of the key takeaways has been that we as a country have fared far worse than almost all wealthy nations. And that was confirmed by a recent analysis in The Lancet. Yeah, I happen to see the same article in the New York Times, uh, and those graphics are, are very compelling and, and, and very sad uh, as well. Uh, the AMA also released a statement. Uh, what did that say? Yeah, we released a joint statement with the American Hospital Association and the American Nurses Association. And that statement really focused on the incredible impact this has had on our healthcare workforce. Uh, saying that our nation's nurses, physicians, and other de dedicated healthcare professionals and essential workers have been on the front lines from day one. They're seeing firsthand the devastating impact the virus has had on far too many patients and families and communities. And that's taken a really large toll on the well being of many of our caregivers and uh, put a spotlight on the need to continue to support those who take care of us. And the statement went on to, of, of course, urge continued vigilance in fighting the virus, reminding us that cases are again on the rise in much of the country. And, and, and as we've seen over the past few years, the virus and its variants are unpredictable and we must remain vigilant and adaptable in the coming months. Where are we exactly with cases right now? 
According to the New York Times, the virus is continuing to spread at, a, at an alarming rate nationwide. They've, those cases have increased threefold since the start of April. They're now rising in nearly every state, but the Northeast and the Midwest continue to be especially hard hit. Uh, in much of, of those two regions, daily case reports are higher today than they were during the peak of last summer's Delta surge. So we're averaging around 95,000 new cases each day. It's a 57% increase from two weeks ago. Um, most of those cases, about 50% are the BA2 Omicron subvariant. We know a growing percentage are BA2 121 and that currently represents a 47, 47.5% of cases and, and that subvariant is increasing. As we know, I think the impact of this surge is, is greater. We've talked about this before than the numbers suggest because a lot of those infections um, are going uncounted uh, due to the rise in uh, at-home testing. Are we also finding that hospitalizations are, are increasing along with uh, case numbers? Hospitalizations are increasing, but not as quickly as cases. So if we look at the New York Times numbers, that COVID hospitalization uh, number has increased 20% over the last two weeks. It remains just around 21,000 nationwide. Um, while it's increasing, it's, it's still far lower than levels we've seen in prior surges. And if we look at deaths, more than 300 uh, deaths are being reported each day on average. And, and that's still a significant number as we inch closer to that 1 million mark, but it's still far fewer than we were seeing at the height of the Omicron surge several months ago, where we were seeing around 2,600 deaths being reported each day. Well, as we think about being prepared for, again, anything that nature throws at us here, has there been any update on pandemic funding that's been, uh, I guess, sitting in Congress? The White House gave some indication on how things would go if that funding doesn't come through. And we'll just say that that picture is pretty bleak. It is, and unfortunately, there's been really uh, no significant movement. Um, as a reminder, the president had asked Congress for 22.5 billion, including 5 billion to fight the pandemic globally. That proposal remains stuck. Lawmakers have been struggling to figure out how to advance that pared down $10 billion COVID package. Um, on Thursday, we heard Dr. Ja, the White House COVID coordinator, outline what would happen if. Congress does not approve that funding. Um, and again, you know, noting that we as a nation would be increasingly vulnerable to COVID in the fall and the winter if Congress doesn't approve more funding for vaccines and treatments soon. Um, he went on to explain that immune protection from the virus is waning. The virus is certainly adapting. It's becoming more contagious and booster doses for most people are gonna be necessary. Um, and then with the potential for uh, enhanced vaccines to protect us. So that new generation of vaccines um, in the fall. So the White House has predicted there could be up to 100 million infections from the virus later this year. That is uh, a very large number. Uh, both Dr. Ja and the president have repeatedly stressed the need to vaccinate, not just in the United States, but also globally. And we heard a lot about that this week as well. Uh, tell us more. Yeah, I think we have to keep in mind that the variants we are seeing now in the US were first out identified outside of the country. And we've heard Dr. Ja say that there's just no room for a do domestic only approach here. Um, and with this in mind, the president hosted a second global COVID-19 vaccination summit this past week. It was a virtual gathering. It was co-hosted by Belize, Germany, Indonesia, and Senegal. Um, some countries were absent, including China, which we know is in the middle of its own COVID surge, and Russia, who was not invited. The meeting was really meant to reinvigorate the global pandemic response as vaccinations and testing flag. Uh, we know that many of those countries in attendance uh, noted that COVID fatigue has really become nearly as big a danger as COVID itself. Uh, President Biden urged the international community in that summit to not get complacent. Global uh, COVID fatigue, I think we are definitely facing that. Is there anything else uh, tangible that came out of the summit? The uh, Biden administration said that the summit produced more than 3 billion commitments toward global, 
global pandemic response and the prevention of future pandemics. We know that Germany, Canada, and Japan pledged large sums to finance testing therapeutics and vaccines, but this is short of the, the 15 billion that the WHO says is needed. Um, the president could not commit as much as he had hoped, due in part to the stalled funding uh, in Congress. The U.S. has, though, already committed 19 billion to the global response. Uh, this time he pledged 200 million for the World Bank Fund to help prepare for future pandemics and 20 million for pilot projects to bring COVID tests and treatments to economically disadvantaged nations. And then he also made a pretty significant non-monetary commitment, which I think uh, some will argue will have even more impact than the, than the funding. What, is, what does that mean, non-monetary commitment? Well, the NIH has agreed to license its stabilized spike protein technology, which we know is a crucial component to COVID vaccines and treatment that will be shared with companies through the Medicines Patent Pool, which is a global nonprofit backed by the WHO. It works to bring medicines to low and middle income nations at a low cost. And so this is significant because it could lay the groundwork for other countries and companies to share their technologies. And the US of course has donated hundreds of millions of vaccines to poor nations that has also, I think, been less open about sharing technology in the past. And as one official pointed out, sharing those doses is viewed as charity, but sharing knowledge really is viewed as justice. Well, that's a great note to end on. Andrea, thanks so much for being here today. We'll be back soon with another COVID-19 update video and podcast. And as always, for resources on COVID-19, go to ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.